Good morning, LBC Radio. This is Corey Rosen with the Story Podcast. Today I have on a special guest, Kenny Bechtel. K.A. Bechtel is a self-published author on Amazon who loves to analyze stories, write fiction, and to think deeply about his faith. His published works include a short story entitled Mud and Daisies, written under the pseudonym of Yannick, that is Y-N-N-E-K. Yannick. Yannick. And a book, a book, a book, a book Uh-oh. of poetry called "Poems for the Redeemed Heart." He is also also the art. He is also the author of the upcoming book series, "The Night of Ladesh." Ooh, that was so not close. Ladash. No one can get this half the time. This is fun. Ayadash. That's his Ayad- oh, it's an, it's an an I. Got yeah. it. Got yeah. it. Ayadash. <laughs> Uh, when he is not writing, he enjoys watching movies with his friends and obsessing over a variety of other nerdy hobbies. You can find his work at these places. He has a website, www.kabechtel, that is K-A-B as in boy, E as in elephant, C as in Charlie, H as in Harold, T as in telephone, E as in elephant again, L as in lion.com. You can find him on Facebook at Yannick. Yenek. Yenek. That is yep. Y N N E K. Uh, Yenek's story bunk at Instagram at K dot A dot Bechtel. Uh, is that dot or underscore? Um, That is a dot. That is a dot. Yes. You can find his books, like a, like you said, on Amazon. So, Kenny, how are you doing today? Doing all right. Yeah. Good. So, what inspired you to be a writer? What was it? Was it C.S. Lewis? Was it the movies that you watch? Was it any music that you listened to? Hmm. I think it was a lot of the above. Um. So, I wasn't always gonna be a writer, but my mind as a child was endlessly imaginative, and you know when you're a kid and you tell stories nonstop, um, you do it just for fun. But eventually, I was thinking. I could probably, you know, write some of these stories mm. um, and actually tell some of them. So kind of what happened was uh, throughout high school, middle school, I started to write poetry and things like that um, just for fun or just to emote or anything like that. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I started that way. Um, I had thousands upon thousands of ideas in my head, um, would doodle during class. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that never stopped, even in college. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, lots lots of doing that. And then one day, it didn't happen all at once, but over time, I gradually started thinking, I think I kind of want to be a writer. Mm. Uh, so took a class on creative writing um, and decided that I was going to try my hand at it. And uh, here I am. I'm uh, in the beginning stages of... Uh, Authorship, I don't know what you call it. Oh, that sounds cool. That sounds um, cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that's kind of my journey in a, nuts, in a nutshell of how I became a writer. It wasn't any kind of snap kind of a thing, uh, but it was a gradual process of realizing that I'm a very creative person mm-hmm. uh, and I'd like to do something about that. So. Yeah. One of the interesting things, I like uh, thinking about your, your journey and knowing you as a friend, uh, was that as a writer... Yeah, you started writing. You started wanting to you, your calling, mm-hmm. uh, which is something we're gonna, we're going to get to talk about. Is that uh, you started writing sermons? You thought you wanted to be a pastor, mm-hmm. and so it's it's really interesting how writing has no matter what it's mm-hmm. been a point of your journey throughout. Because you have to write to be a pastor, and to be a good sermons. pastor, you have to write yes. good sermons. I always wrote out my sermons. I was told plenty of times you shouldn't write out your sermons. Just bullet points. Yeah, just bullet points. Um, but every single time I would write full paragraphs of text because I feel like I'm a better writer than I am a talker. So mm. I'm bad at memory. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> but um, yeah, I always wrote out the uh, sermons and all of that uh, and not not too much changed. I'm still writing things out. Mm. So yeah. It's, yeah. So do you want to uh, get into the idea of calling and what, what does it mean for God to call you to certain things? What does it mean for uh for you personally? Because that has that means it's it's a it's a very subjective thing. Mm-hmm. Yes. So you do you want me to jump right into the calling section? Let's do it. Okay, let's jump into it. Calling. What is a calling? Do you know if you're called, and how do you know if you're called? These are questions 
I'm still gra- grappling with. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've I've come to a few conclusions that I'm also still willing to be challenged on. Um, for so let me I'll I'll get I'll get I'll start it this way. Um, I came to Lancaster Bible College as a pastoral ministry major. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know entirely if I wanted to do pastoral ministry. Um, but I was thinking, you know what? Why not? Let's let's see, and then. If I'm not called there, God will take me somewhere else, uh, mm-hmm. and then I'll be able to uh, um, use this education elsewhere. Um, so I went through college to be a pastor, um, and I felt like that was my maybe my calling. I don't think I ever had a full, I feel like I am totally 100% called to be a pastor. Mm. Um, but I've always, I have the gift of preaching. Um, and I was like, what else do you yes, do you with that? Thanks. <laughs> uh, what else do you do with that, though? Like, is I, I don't know. At least as a high schooler, I didn't know. So uh, what I decided to do was I was going to go to college um, to be a pastor. Mm-hmm. Um, and over, like, four years of college, I started to gradually see, I don't think I'm called to be a pastor. Uh, until it came to uh, junior year, finished that up, did a... Uh, Marvelous internship. I love the internship um, at my home church uh, that I grew up in. Um, but by the end of it, I didn't feel called to be a pastor. Mm. By the end of it, I also wrote a book um, <laughs> in my free time after the church, uh, like after work at the church um, those days as well. So I was starting to wonder, maybe I'm called to something else. Maybe mm. I'm called to be a writer. I don't know. Have you ever thought, because thinking about uh, what you're saying now is that, uh, yeah, you maybe have the gift of preaching, but what form would that preaching take place in? Yes. Because um, as a writer, you can write stories that are not necessarily preachy, but yeah. it's, it's you know, you write sermons mm-hmm. uh, just in a complex story form. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I want to write sermons in complex story form. Um, well, I mean, I mean, like, uh, like... Redeeming art, you yes. get the right redeeming art, which is in of itself a, uh, it's you know, it's, it's preaching to yeah. a certain extent. Yeah, um, to an extent. Yeah, I would argue that a lot of C.S. Lewis was a, just long sermons in creative, fan, fantastical uh, ways. Yeah, like the Book of Narnia. That's pretty. It's that's a big it's, allegory. That's a big allegory. Uh, a big sermon on on mm. on Christ and, and so many so many things. Yeah. Uh, in regards to Christian uh, doctrine, at least, yes. just in in fantastical, uh, imagine like if if you gave a three year old the Bible and said, "What story?" Here, go read Leviticus. Yeah. Well, no, like <laughs> it, well, it would probably be like uh, Mark or Mark or like one of the Gospels because it's it it Aslan is a big giant yes. part of it, mm-hmm. and then you have the the evil uh, the Winter Lady. Yeah, and um, like all these different things. Yeah, if you get, if probably, it it would be a, sim- a similar tale, um, in in regards of its outlandishness. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it's really interesting how a calling or a gift can, uh, go to towards different callings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and C.S. Lewis is interesting too. Um, I don't remember the exact quote, and it's C.S. Lewis. So there's a thousand quotes There's out thousand there, quotes. uh, and a lot of them aren't actually his. Uh, yeah, <laughs> which is hilarious. Um, everyone just loves him so much, I guess, that they gotta misquote him. No, so. I love the quote from Abraham Lincoln: uh, "Don't, don't believe everything you see on the internet." Oh, uh, best <laughs> Abe Lincoln quote ever, man! He just pulled that one out of his hat. I bet. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so that was a terrible pun. I am so sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like one of the things that Lewis kind of saw in his writings um, was. Like, there's one great myth, and that myth is true, and that's what we see in Scripture. It's the truest one. Um, So from that, um, all other myths, all other forms of story, um, shadows and, like, mirrors the true uh, story of the Bible. Mm. Um, So that's another inspiration that I had uh, while um, just thinking through all of this uh, and wanting to start getting into writing and all of that so so moving back to the calling what is it that how 
how do you find or know what your calling is? Because there's so many uh, facets of that. Because you have your own plan. God mm. has his own plan. How do you know uh, what you're doing is what God wants you to do? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, and a lot of times it's hard to know that. Um, sometimes I'm not even sure if we can be certain to a certain extent for certain things, whether or not this or that is the call of God. Um, mm. So, for instance, uh, after I started questioning whether I was called to be a pastor, um, I started to think maybe I was called to be a writer. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, I just put my whole heart and soul into writing, um, and it became a passion of mine. Um, so for a while, I thought, I am totally called 100% to be a writer. Um, that is my uh, goal in life. That is my purpose in life. Um, the reason I live is to write because it's my calling but that's not exactly a healthy mindset mm. um to have like your whole purpose be just to write and i started to realize that um over time um and i started to question because i was doing the same thing okay now i'm questioning because you know if you're a writer um and it might be the same with like composing music or anything else like um that's creative you question yourself all the time yes um is this good enough and if this isn't good enough, am I good enough? Yes. Why do we as artistic people do this? I don't know. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of self-torture, <laughs> if we're being quite honest. It is. Yes, it's terrible. Uh, so we all got to do better at that, guys. Um, but, yeah, so I started questioning those kind of things. And then, of course, you question, am I called to be a writer now? And so I went through this whole crisis of sorts of like, okay, I'm not called to be a pastor. What am I doing? I went to college for this degree. Paid all that money for this degree, still, <laughs> still am. Um, and like, what am I going to do with this? Uh, so I put my heart and soul into writing. And then the question is, okay, if I put my heart and soul into this, what if this also isn't what I'm called to be? Mm. Um, but recently I've been thinking through these questions. And I've been trying to think through it biblically. Um, at one point I was thinking, oh, there's no such thing as a calling. Um, I think that's a little bit overkill. Yeah, um, a little bit. <laughs> that's the, oh no, I'm doomed kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is. And I think the, that calling is found in uh, um, the book of Genesis, mm. um, where God basically tells Adam and Eve, uh, multiply and build, create. Yes. So, like, and both of those can be done various ways. I mean, multiply, obviously, you know, you can get married, have kids. Mm -hmm. uh, you can share the gospel with people. Um, you can do all sorts of things. Um, you do, build. You can do math. Math? Multiply. Ah! ah. ah. <laughs> okay, that's, that, I'm giving you that one. Oh, my goodness. What <laughs> terrible. Love it, though. <laughs> yeah, you can do math. There you go. Uh, math is greater than uh, magic uh, for those who have seen that movie. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, sorry, Spider-Man references. You get that. Yeah, I got sometimes. you. I get that one. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so what was I saying? We got, oh, right. Okay. Genesis, yep. Genesis, exactly. Um, so, and then, like, with the create, like, the building and creating side, like, there's plenty of things we can do. Um, I mean, like, you can literally build a building. Um, yes. You can uh, do all sorts of other things, like... Uh, you can build um, yourself up. You can build your mm -hmm. friends up. You yeah. can build a, a network. You can build... That. You can do all sorts of things in regards to building and creating. You can build a song. You can create a song. You yeah. Can, mm -hmm. You can do... You can do a lot of things, and that that includes creating, and you can help sustain as well. And that's, exactly. and that's, and that's another one of the God's the creator, yeah. and He's also the sustainer of all things, and that includes housekeeping, which I currently do mm. as my full time job. Um, I sustain uh, with my friends this campus, uh, which is messy sometimes. It's a Yes, so, please big, messy flush the campus. toilet when you're done, guys. Please. Yes, the dorms. <laughs> the dorms. Dorms. Anyway, crazy. Uh, yeah. So you found that in Genesis, and yes. then what? Um. So I, I've just been thinking through that, and um, I've been realizing, yeah, I do have a calling, and even if I don't know if God's going to be taking me to point A or point B, I do know, however, that um, one, my God is faithful, and He's not going to abandon me because He loves me for whatever reason. Ah, that reason's Jesus. Mm. I love Jesus. Um, <laughs> love Jesus. <laughs> yeah, He's the best. <laughs> Woo. Um, but. Uh, yeah, um, I was, I got so excited about Jesus, forgot what I was saying. 
Um, <laughs> uh, so you're, you're calling uh, yes. Genesis and what, what you do from yeah. there. So I wasn't sure exactly. Uh, and I've been th- over the past few months, I've been thinking through what exactly is my calling. And I think my calling is that multiply build. So whatever I do, uh, even if writing doesn't become a full time thing, which that's my hope. I have some cool projects coming out uh, that I hope you guys are excited about. If you're not, I am. We'll talk uh, about that later for sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, whatever the case is, I can be sure that um, if my mindset is to uh, uh, multiply and create, um, that God can use basically anything I do. Uh, so I don't necessarily need to be a pastor to minister. I don't even necessarily need to be a writer to be able to mm. minister. Because uh, I see personally my writing a lot, a lot of times as a ministry. Um, mm. So... Ultimately, that's that's my thoughts on calling, uh, and I'm willing to be challenged by people on that. I do believe there are certain things like people are uh, called to be a pastor, um, but even then, I've seen pastors who choose to leave the church in good terms um, because they don't feel called to be a pastor anymore or there's something else. So I think a lot of times, what we're called to is where God puts us. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because I do believe that calling does change and evolve mm-hmm. over time. Uh, so it's it's been really interesting uh, for me when I was a child. I, I, I felt like I was being called to being a scientist, a, a zookeeper is what I wanted to be mm. specifically because I just I love animals. I still love animals and I just want to take care of animals. And I was very much all about animals and all about science, too. But then uh, when my mother passed, uh, she was a scientist. I, I grew this OCD like behavior uh, towards science where I can't touch anything related to science or I feel dirty, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that just really just shoved me into doing because the only thing I, I I did outside of science was music. Yeah. So it it just shoved me into music, and it's it's interesting. Sometimes callings are very obvious, and sometimes they're not obvious at all. Because, mm-hmm. um, for example, last night it it was pretty obvious that God did not want me watching TV, doing my computer, or anything because it all just kept shutting off repeatedly, <laughs> over and oh, over that again. Happens. <laughs> yeah, the technology is just being stupid. Yep. So I was like, you know what? Fine, I'll go to bed. How about that? <laughs> and then I went to bed. So it's it's really funny how uh, calling can it's it's never concrete. Yeah, and it's not obvious all the time. There's a lot of prayer that goes into it. There's a lot of uh, self reflection that goes mm-hmm. into it. There's a lot of reading the Bible that goes yes. into it to figure out exactly what it is or. What lights a fire in my soul when mm-hmm. whenever I read a certain passage, and uh, for for me it was a lot of the psalms that lit a fire under me, and mm-hmm. you know psalms the psalms were, were music. Yes, exactly. And uh, David was the the main writer of those songs. I really saw myself within David, not the not the Goliath story, but rather mm-hmm. the uh, the more tragic aspects of yeah. his mm-hmm. story that really inspired me to do music. Yeah. So. Going on, uh, do you want to talk about the poems of the redeemed heart and what got you inspired into that? What made you want to start writing poems? You did work in the music industry a little bit with like musical theater. You, you did some of I that. I say work, uh, but I dipped my toes you, in. Yeah, I you had dipped a your blast. Toes in it. Yeah. So yeah, um, I music. It's interesting because like I've been doing musicals and stuff like that uh, for fun. Um, like in high school, uh, in college. Mm -hmm. Uh, But before then, I did not do any music stuff. Uh, This is hilarious because I don't even know what grade it was. It was was an elementary school. Um, We were singing some sad song or something, (sighs) and little Kenny was like, this is sad. So I just like randomly started crying uh, during uh, whatever you call it, um, during the music. Um, during the concert? We were suppo- yes, the concert. We were supposed to be singing. I was crying. And since then, I'm like, I'm never going to sing in front of people ever again. Um, so then I decided uh, somewhere in high school um, because they did a Beauty and the Beast and that was amazing. And I was like, you know what? I, I think I might actually like to do a musical or something. You went to Hempfield, right? No, I went to Northern Lebanon. Northern Lebanon. Okay, we got okay. tractors. We got tractors. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, that was uh, a thing growing up. Um, uh, for the city folk, uh, people sometimes drive their tractors to school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's really funny. <laughs> it is. It, <laughs> it's cool. Just park a tractor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of cool, though. It's like... 
at least you're being unique. Right. It's you know, like, if you who, have a tractor, who's got why the not? best car? It's like there's a tractor, there's a yeah. there's a pickup truck, there's a yeah. You know. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I had a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> we had an awesome uh, music teacher, uh, Mrs. Masa. She was awesome. Uh, so shout out to her. Um, but yeah, so I was like, okay, cool. I'm gonna do some uh, um, the play. I don't sing in a play, right? Mm. So I did a play. I go for a small part. Um, I get a medium sized part with a lot of talking, cast as the dad character who gets to yell and bang his head off yes. the piano. So much fun. Uh, that was the man who came to dinner. Uh, and then the next year it was uh, um, uh, Arsenic and Old Lace. And uh, I got to be uh, Teddy Brewster, who thought he was Theodore Roosevelt and yelled, Charge! all the time. So much fun. So I, I have a. And then, you know, I was in. Uh, um, Mary Poppins. Mary here. Poppins here as Mr. Banks. Uh, oh no, you're no, the bank oh, teller. You're the bank teller. No, you're the bank teller. Ch- uh, teller. Uh, yeah. Ruining the bank is yes, still yes, one of my favorite yes. lines ever. Um, I was. Uh, um, uh, oh, what was what was the other ones? We I did, know this. There was there was Ruth. We we did. Uh, you were you weren't in. I you was were, in Ruth. You were in Ruth. Ruth yes. Ruth. Ruth. Um, Science th- sounds. Uh, yes. Uh, that was that was amazing. Um, yeah, that one, uh, Science Sound, uh, we, we performed it here at LBC, not at Science Sound. Yeah, and it was, like, the first time, the first uh, time, yeah, the first, Sight and Sound's property and all that, that yeah, we, LBC got the chance to produce the first Sight and Sound production that was not performed at a Sight and Sound location. Yeah, and it was so sweet, too, because Mr. Felty let me, uh, uh, teach the devotionals. Yeah, that's what I remember, yeah. I was bitter at that time because of the whole calling thing and all, mm-hmm. um, and like a whole lot of stuff, and just being able to teach those and see how uh, um, Naomi goes from being empty the fool was powerful in my life. Mm. So thank you, Mr. Felty, uh, for letting me teach that. Um, uh, so that was that was fun. Ruth was fun. Um, I was the character Reuven. Um, there was uh, in Bye Bye Birdie, I was like the mayor character. Mm. Uh, that was a fun one. Um, Oh, what was the other one? Um, oh, yeah, it was uh, Hello, Dolly. Yes, Hello, Hello right. Dolly. That was a fun one. Um, and I was uh, the old guy at the... I was the judge. Um, I forget what I said in that one, uh, but it was fun. I wore a wig, a big curly wig. It was great. <laughs> so uh, how do you... Does, does that translate into you wanting to do poems more like structured? Because uh, music is poetry. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. Um, so I started writing poetry around middle grade a lot during uh, um, uh, like high school and college. Um, so I can vividly remember me sitting in the back of like the music room uh, in high school on this little like black rocking. Well, it's it's a normal like computer chair, mm-hmm. but the wheels are missing. So I use it as a nice little ground rocking chair, just writing poems and things like that on my off time. Um, being around music uh, and being in like that environment definitely helped a lot of the words be more um, lyrical. I think mm-hmm. um, I don't have any music. My 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 expertise is not in writing music or anything like right. that. Um, so I don't even try that. But I try to write uh, poetry. Um, but yeah, doing uh, musicals helped a lot um, to be able to help me to become a better uh, poet. Um, but for me, a lot of times, like like with this book, um, a lot of times it was just me kind of sitting, uh, thinking through something in the Bible or th- thinking through something in my life um, and like trying to convey emotion and feeling and uh, truth as well. I'm putting all those together on the page. Um, and just trying to communicate through poem, uh, and that's kind of that's kind of where these all of this poetry came from, um, if that makes sense. So, so it's a it's a collection of multiple years of yeah. poetry. Yes. Gotcha. This was not written in the day. Uh, this book it was written well, in about. I mean, no book are written. That's what I was about to say. What I tried, uh, <laughs> um, but. Um, not written in the day. It was written over like maybe somewhere between six to eight years. Uh, some of some of the poems you read in this book came from might be one or two middle school Kenny ones, uh, but a lot of them are high school Kenny or college Kenny poems. Mm. Um, so I don't know if I can pinpoint when I wrote this or that, um, or even the stories behind half of them. Um, mm. But 
Yeah, it, this was a work of multiple years. Um, it was not written overnight. Uh, I just started to slowly make sure that I like con- collected all of the uh, different poems I did. So what was it like to uh, put it all together? Oh. <laughs> the publishing process is annoying. <laughs> I, I don't doubt that. <laughs> yeah, so writing is so much fun. I could do it all day. Um, but uh, the whole publishing process is very annoying. So my first book wasn't Poems for the Redeemed Heart. It was Mud and Daisies. I went under the pseudonym of Yenik, which is Kenny spelled backwards, because I thought that was cool for whatever reason. Um, it's not. Um, K.A. Beck was way more professional. It, it, yes. <laughs> I'm glad I decided to switch that. Um, but it was fun while it was. Um, I still got to rebrand some of my website and all that. Um, but... Uh, yeah, the the whole publishing process uh, can be annoying. There's a few ways to go. Uh, currently, with the book that I'm writing right now, I'm trying to go the traditional publishing route, mm. uh, which basically I will send um, like these query letters, which are basically saying, hey, here's my book. Here's what it's about. Uh, here's why I think you might be interested in representing it. Uh, and then I'll send those letters to agents, and then the agents will say yay or nay. Uh, it's a very tedious process. Um and you never really know if you're going to have people say, yeah, I want this book, if it's the market or not. Because sometimes books don't fit the market right. as well. Um, and that's a hard thing as an author because you might have a book that you're very passionate about and other people have read. It just doesn't fit the market. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll see if it fits the market or not or if I'll pave my own path. Um, that's the best way, I think, uh, for many, uh, like the easiest way probably to do it. Though, if I ever do become a traditionally published uh, guy, I'm not sure if I'll still call it easy. We'll see. Right. Um, but it's probably a lot of emails you got to send because you, yeah. surely you shouldn't just email one and then no. and then what if they deny it you email another but you have to probably just send just a bunch yep. and and figure and uh, cold calling but emails cold yes it's right. horrible it's horrible yeah I <laughs> there's a lot of emails I've had to send for like story, the story podcast and it's mm. it's wildly unprofessional for me because it's because i'm not used to writing no. emails i i don't know what the proper etiquette is once funnily enough I one time asking people stuff yeah well, it's it's, it's <laughs> asking how do you how do you ask people stuff yeah. how do you uh present and do that professionally yes there's uh, i've realized one of the fun, one funny story i have from uh college was that the the director the head director of LB, of lbc's like mw page department was like hey when you email me you should it, it you should say, uh, Doctor Paul, comma, it, and because I never really had like intros. I would mm. I would just say, hey, this is what I need, and, and like again, I have a question. This is the question. Yeah, yeah. And it, mm-hmm. but he he was like, you really need to learn how to do a proper email if you want to get anywhere. And I was like, I guess. <laughs> Even better than I would do uh, for work. A lot of times I used to. Sometimes still do, but I know them. They're cool. Um, just put dumb emojis or gifs in it. Uh, oh my! So that's the worst. Don't do that. I haven't done that for any of the agents that I've uh, um, I've uh, sent them to. So I I've learned that lesson of being uh, professional, and I'm still learning that. Um, I wore a nice shirt today. I usually mm. just wear a Star Wars shirt or something. Professionalism is something that I have had to really dial in over the college. Because you know me. I used to wear the stupid shirts all the time and gym shirts. They're fun. They're, they were so fun. I got comfy. Co- co- they're comfy, and I got compliments on them. But um, it, it would always give me weird looks when I would ever like go into like the professional setting. I didn't have uh, any dress shirts. This is mm. actually a dress shirt from like uh, I had four years ago that I, I just randomly found and it surprisingly still fits. So uh, I, I and all the newer dress shirts. I, have you seen me wear my newer dress shirts? I might have. I um, don't know. I it's funny. I bought those two years ago to impress a girl, and uh, they didn't fit me at all because you know sizes are weird when you yeah. order them from like Amazon or yep. whatever, <laughs> Dressly, whatever. But now surprisingly, they fit me and they work really well. It's good. So it's it's professionalism is definitely uh, something you have to think about within the music realm, and and you have to realize that you have to dress for the occasion. Yeah. Because there are times where you can wear silly shirts, and that's totally fine. And that's actually what's preferred. If if you wear a suit or a dress shirt, you're going to be out of place at, mm-hmm. at some of these places. So it, it's it's really important to because yeah, you want to have your own style, 
and mm-hmm. and that's that's for sure. You want to have like your own dressing style, your own fashion style, and that is yes important. But also, you need to be a you have to work within the system you're in. Yeah, you're not gonna get anywhere if you go to a professional meeting or like something like this, like the story podcast, uh, which is not that professional. I'm not I'm not trying to sell myself higher than what I am. He is super professional. I am the like, ultimate professional person. I never make mistakes. Never ever. ever, ever he is perfect. Clearly. I am. I, I'm not going to say heresy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go that far. But um, uh, it's, you got to realize people are going to be watching this and people who are going to look for professionalism are going to watch this. I, I granted I have an unbuttoned shirt here, but it's, it's also kind of the style I'm going for. I'm mm-hmm. not going for like yeah. ultimate professionalism. Mm-hmm. So yeah, find your style is definitely important. Yeah. Uh, so what's it like to not do the pr- pr- back to publishing? What yeah. is it like to not do the tr- traditional style of publishing? Yeah. So that was the whole traditional style. Uh, uh, and then with that, if you do traditional, you have a whole like the agents represent you. You have a publishing house to do all the editing. Editing must be a nightmare. Editing, yes, is the nightmare. Um. <laughs> so. Let's talk about self-publishing, which is what I do, and it's a pain, but I will endure the pain because it's worth it. Yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of things you have to think about. Uh, Mm. So, for example, this book of poems right here is the one that I have with the lovely paperclip not included. Uh, Clothespin not included, not paperclip. Let's be uh, real here. So, um, this one of the things you have to think about is cover. Now, Amazon, I use Amazon.com uh, to do it because it's the easiest way to do it. Um, and mm. it's Amazon, so pretty accessible it's to most people. Literally built off selling books. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, like that's what I do uh, with this. Um, they have this cover maker, um, but I'm not a big fan of it. Because mm. you just click and drag like things, and uh, it's not very. It doesn't look very professional, and I try to have my covers as professional looking as possible. Yeah, for anyone who's buying a book, you definitely do judge the book by its cover. Yes, yeah, they like as much as we wish you didn't. We know people judge books by the covers, mm. so yeah. Uh, what what I did for Mud and Daisies, which was the short story I wrote. Um, uh, I had a friend, um, from, uh, 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 high school, high school, uh, Rebecca Preble, uh, she did the cover art, uh, and she did an amazing job on that one. Um, oh, and for yeah, yeah, uh, she drew it all out. Um, and cover art's not her thing. Uh, she's, I think from what I remember, currently a tattoo artist and she's like really doing really good from what I've seen That's on cool. Facebook. So, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get a tattoo needles. Ouch. Like all just like, I, as hate art. Yep. I, I don't mm-hmm. hate needles. Like, no, I hate needles. I can't do it. <sighs> well, then I'm not going to describe the feeling of a needle going into you at all for you. Well, I already know what it feels. I've had it done to me several times. And I gotcha. Hate it. <laughs> yeah. I've had it done to me too much, but yeah. So it's cool. I wouldn't, I wouldn't wear like uh, art on your arm. At least I used to, I, I don't think I ever will, but like I've, have a big appreciation for like tattoos now too because like as an artist now i'm like huh i get that wanting to show off your art and who you are that makes sense me would i do it no um it, but yeah. i respect that a lot now more more than i did when i was a kid um because yeah, you have biases as a kid yeah, there's it's definitely kind of a, well there's a christian stigma against that too as it's well dumb. it's uh there are some scriptures valid scriptures yeah. that that do like don't mark your body or stuff yeah. like that. And I I see those in an old covenant kind yeah. of text. Yes, that's so, that's exactly yeah. that's exactly the point. It's like exactly. it's it's in the, it's in the old covenant, not the new covenant. Yeah. Uh, so it's it, it's it, but yeah, a tattoo artist and to have the capability to draw something on a human with it looking good. Yeah, I know it's pretty impressive. It's isn't not, it? one of my best friends, uh, Cody Kilburn. I'm gonna have him on next Monday actually. Uh, he is incredible. The, the, the process he has to go through to create like these flowers on not, uh, not flat surfaces. We'll call it <laughs> that. Um, yeah. it's incredible yeah. to, to do it and to manage people like wiggling and pain oh and, and like writhing in pain yeah. because people don't realize how because you know, there's different sensitive areas of, of the body. Yeah, that your mm-hmm. arm isn't as sensitive as maybe your face or your neck or what or whatever. Yeah, uh, I and your fingers especially. 
Um, so you have to the amount of talent is incredible. Yeah. But for cover art, yeah. So she did the cover art for that. Um, and for that, um, because I'm trying to get into the art and all, uh, I did pay her for that. So there's some money Good. that is involved. Um, she gave me a nice discount, so thank you so much. Um, but for this one as well, um, this was done by uh, uh, my pastor at that time uh, from the church that I grew up at, uh, Pastor uh, David Brandt. Mm. Um, he is a tech wizard, uh, and he's good with Photoshop and all. And this lovely cover um, was done by him. Yeah, um, it's really good. Yeah, and for free, which oh, was nice. the sweetest thing ever. Um, cause he did not have to do that. And I was totally going to pay him, uh, but he insisted. So, um, yeah. So cover art is one of the things you have to consider. Uh, mm. and a lot of times that will involve money. Um, yes. you should expect it to, um, not everyone would do things for free. Um, and, and I'm which be, makes sense yes. because livelihoods. Yeah. <laughs> to make a point on that, um, there's. I'm not selling yeah. my books for free. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's for like cover art for 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 my uh I did I did my logo myself, but yeah. I'm gonna it, it's it can be done better. Uh, that, that's mm. what I'm gonna say, uh, and I'm gonna have it done better by uh for some friends of mine, and and uh, I'm always an advocate for paying your friends. Yep. Uh, because first off it's supporting them like mm. yeah they'll do it for free but also i'm going to i'm going to pay you regardless because i i think you deserve it and um and uh so that's that's my thought process and yeah finding people to do your art i think it's so much better that like, yeah you can go on fiverr and mm -hmm. find somebody who will do a great job or you know the person you but you know the them. person and exactly. and it's it's a much cleaner process of yeah. like hey i want this changed a little bit can you do that mm. and cuz someone yep. someone that you don't know is going to be like it's gonna get annoyed and never yeah. work for you again. But a friend, maybe, maybe also a little slightly annoyed. They're your friend, you know. Mm. They're gonna, they're gonna support you, and it's, it's supporting, you know, it's, it's community. That's what it yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. So if you ever have to have somebody do a cover art, even ask some of your friends. Hey, do you know anybody that does this? Mm. I, my, one of my best friends in the entire world. She went to a, a, a art college in Philly, and I am always asking her. Hey, do any of your friends know? Because chances are, I, I've I've met them as well. Mm -hmm. But I'd love to give them work because you know they're struggling college students. Yeah, and the college <laughs> students definitely need money. Yeah, they do. So I I'd love to support them. Yeah, yeah, and I think a lot of times art is community. Like, mm -hmm. um, art isn't just made in a vacuum. It's made with and around community, people. Yeah. Um, no matter how you look at it, because like like I said with this cover art uh, for both of those books. Um, it's a community kind of a thing where I need to ask for help with this and be willing to pay, uh, expect to pay, and expect want to pay, to pay yep. even. Um, yeah, 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 wanting to pay. Exactly. Is, yes. Um, like, so I need help with that. I can't do it, so someone else is going to have to do that uh, and uh, really be able to carry that section. And then editing. Um, I do a lot of the editing myself story-wise or even like for the poems. Um, just like, okay, does this make sense kind of a thing. Like formatting uh, too. Formatting. Probably, yeah. I'm not the best at grammar. Um, so for both of the two books that I've published so far, uh, one of the ladies from the church that I grew up at, her name is Betty. Uh, Betty Herb, you're amazing. Um, she like edited like crazy these two books and found all the grammar errors um and like it's it's solid like it's really good um and i was i was blessed by that uh and the funny thing is like she wasn't a big fan like it wasn't her mud and daisies is not her style of story mm. um and that's that's okay um but she was willing to edit that now she loved the poem book that was her style um but the willingness to edit that was so great. So what was so far? Let's summarize what we've got <laughs> is we've got cover, we've got I have to make edits, we've got someone else is going to come he in here and make edits. Um, then if we're talking about the books that I'm currently writing, um, I want people because it's a narrative, a big narrative, uh, a branching narrative. I want to make sure it makes sense, the characters make sense, that um, they're pushing the plot forward, things like that. Just create interest for the next book. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but 
I have my friends read it. Um, I have mm. different people read it uh, that are interested in the genre, are interested in what I'm writing. Uh, and then they give me feedback of, Kenny, this is great. I love this. Kenny, this doesn't make sense. Uh, what are you doing here? Oh, well, try it this way. Huh. Huh. That does work that way. I like that better. It's kind of how it goes sometimes. Yeah, so. I've, been a, I've been a part, uh, a party to a few of those conversations. Uh -huh. um, it's, it's very interesting. Do you want to, uh, is that pretty much all you had to say about the self-publishing process? Um, basically with Amazon, it is. You, you might want to get a, uh, a barcode. Um, mm -hmm. There's different ways to do it too. You get a bunch of extra copies to see if it actually looks right. You got to format. Format's yep. a pain. Uh, but that's all under the editing branch. Right. Uh, so it's it's a pain, but it's a blessed pain. <laughs> it, there, there's some people who really thrive throughout the pain of like the creative process. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something I kind of want to get into now is uh, how do you create a story? How does that process work? Is it all in your head? Do you write it all down? Do you do plot points? Do you do bullet points? Because for me, when I was running my musical, uh, a lot of it I had already just fleshed out in my head i was like all right i'm gonna have this slave family that need to escape to mm -hmm. the north all right so how does that happen i've I, I start listing out my characters and figuring out the relationships between them and then i slowly just did plot point by plot point and i started interconnecting the characters because i thought that was way more fun than just not yeah and then uh so i, I <laughs> it was literally lines like all right savannah goes here and tells this and then all right next and uh, next what happens it this happens next it, it was a way more detailed than just like plot point plot mm -hmm. point plot point but it was it was it was basically a uh you, you like like an action list yes a list of actions and then yes. from then on i i did dialogue and then uh just expanded it more and more and then from there from the dialogue i did the music and uh through that process what is it like for you the process of writing that's that's a good question i've tried it a few times uh i'm going i'm going to when i'm thinking through this i'm going to think through this in the terms of the book that's not yet released the night of Iodash. um without giving any away any spoilers of course because mm -hmm. i want you guys to be able to enjoy that uh, when you get it um but i'm going to think through the process of writing that because that was a pretty expansive one um, compared to what I've already uh, written so far. Um, with that one, I thought of the idea up when I was in high school, mm. doodling uh, doodles in Spanish class, um, <laughs> thinking very C.S. lewis -y, like, oh, I would like to have this knight with this powerful armor kind of a thing. Now, a lot of the powerful armor stuff has disappeared, but there is one thing in it, a powerful sword. Um, so while, while I'm thinking through all of these things, I had that idea, um, and I just continued to think through it. Um, I will open up a sketchbook. I will doodle these characters so that I can, for some reason for me, writing and drawing is connected. Uh, granted, I'm not the best uh, like artist, um, but like it helps me think through some things. So I'll doodle these characters. Um, this is how this character looks. This is how that character looks. Um, I'll try to do the background sometimes, not great at backgrounds. Mm. Uh, so... I will doodle things, I will think through things, and then I start making like outlines and stuff like that. And a lot of times these are just bullet points. Like, I think it would be cool if this character did this, or I think it would be cool if this character did that. Um, gotcha, so it wasn't more of like a storyline, it was just more of like, oh, what if they did this? Yeah, I start a lot of times with like images in my head, because I'm very imaginative. Mm -hmm. um, as a kid, like you know, when you're in the car and like you, like, the uh, you see someone chasing along you, along yes, the car, exactly, yeah. and jumping it's over all the signs, usually and like jumping from like building the building yep. and all of that. Um, it's like I'm always so imaginative, um, and so I will think of like one of the images in uh, this book uh, without giving anything away is this creaky old bridge that's falling apart. Um, with fire around and a duel in the middle of it. Mm. And I'm just like, that is an image that I really, really love. Um, and I want to do something with that. Um, so I will think through that. Um, I'll have these moments playing on repeat in my mind, uh, sometimes to the point where I obsess over them. I'm basically living these stories out in my mind. Um, 
And uh, yeah, then I'll start writing down things with the characters. In my mind, I'll form the story. Like, okay, I want to get this to this point. I want to get this to that point. Uh, and then I'll start forming the story. So I will usually, what I like to do is like a paragraph, like a small, maybe not a paragraph, like smaller paragraphs. Um, like a, not even scene sometimes. Sometimes it's scene, sometimes it's moment by moment. It's depending how vivid it is. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, sort of outline of the book. So like I know with um the the Night of Ayadash, um that's maybe I have like a three page outline that's been edited a bazillion times, um for the first and for the second one because it's a two part series with room to expand. Um, so I will imagine it first. I would doodle a little bit uh, during the whole process, half, half the part just for the fun of it, uh, but the other half a part is like it actually helps me think through some things. Mm -hmm. um, then I will start with the outlines, um, and then I'll start attempting some writing uh, things. So I first tried to write the story when I was, was in college, uh, maybe freshman, uh, or uh, what's the one after freshman? Sophomore? Sophomore, yeah. <laughs> Freshman or sophomore year. I have this version of the story, and this story is a fantasy uh, story as it is now, but at that point it was some weird fantasy sci-fi hybrid that I don't know why I was thinking that was a good idea. Mm. Um, it could have worked in certain things, but not that story. Um, so I tried to write it a few times. Uh, eventually I gave up multiple times, and then I decided I was going to sit down. I did that outline thing, um, and I, in my mind I worked it enough in my mind that I'm like, I'm sold. I've sold myself on this story. I've told it to other people, um, again, community, art as a community, and they seem to be vibing with the story. They seem to like it. Uh, so what I do at then is I decided that I'm going to sit down and consistently write, and I did that. Um, and then after that, you have a book. <laughs> but you need to edit the book and yes. go back. So after I have it all written, I do the outline, I get to the writing, you go back, you look at all the things, you see what works, what doesn't vibe with you. Because a lot of times I just go off gut feeling. Mm -hmm. um, you need guts and you need logic. They both are important. Um, they both need a balance. Emotion and logic and writing needs a balance in every page. It's, it's a hard act sometimes. But um, I'll go back, I'll see what I think works, what doesn't. Um, and then, yeah, I'll just make edits. Uh, I know at one point in one of the stories, I felt the one character wasn't pushing it along as much as it should. Uh, so I made some major edits to that, and I love it now. Um, so it's a lot of catching your mistakes as you go, um, taking notes of them, going back. But yeah, I start, I start with an idea, an imagination, um, and then an outline. And then I write the full thing. It's, it's, some people will just write things uh, without an outline. Uh, some people need an outline. I'm a little bit of both, so that's fair. Yeah, I didn't really need an outline. It it, it was kind of almost free flow in some mm. aspects. Um, but uh, when I got serious about writing the story, I was like, okay, I have to figure it out. Uh, I got to figure out where it ends. Figure out uh, different plot points because you know, a slave family from being enslaved to escaping that's a lot to happen. Yeah, and to fit it in the musical. Mm -hmm. Time span is a lot to consider. What's the average musical time span? Um, so it's usually I'm not a professional, but I'm gonna say it's like an hour thirty, two hours. That makes sense. Okay, yeah. Um, that's pretty short for like that. Pretty story. short for for yeah. that story. Yeah, yeah. It, and uh, to get all the plot points and beats mm -hmm. that I want. Uh, so I'm I was I'm heavily considering. Uh, what if what if I just made it into like a short little TV series? Mm -hmm. Like like uh, Netflix sometimes puts on like six episodes yeah. of uh, one hour things. Kenobi. And, and yeah, I, yeah, right. Disney has been doing that too. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like that would be a lot more fun. It it would be just a lot more time just to sit with the characters and really it, it pull at the heartstrings yeah. at it. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I, that's that's kind of uh, where I'm at now. But I definitely need to. I don't have the technology to do or the capability as of yet. To, as of yet, uh, as of yet, as of yet, <laughs> to, to uh, put that into production, but mm -hmm. I should definitely figure. It, it's been weird because 2020 happened and oh, the yeah. George Floyd riots happened, yeah. and and that just put a whole different light on mm -hmm. uh, like Black history as yeah. as in as in general. Mm -hmm. um, and so I I kind of haven't had a chance. I haven't gone back to it in a very long time. I haven't really looked at it beside or uh, gone back to it at all. 
mm-hmm. besides rewriting or reworking the first song because I think it's one of my strongest uh, songs ever that I've ever written. Um, because I, I've I've worked on it so much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I definitely ha- and there's something to be said about that too. Uh, doing a project, leaving it aside, and then coming back to it was mm-hmm. because different mindset. You got to refamiliarize refamiliarize yourself with it, and then uh, that oftentimes, at least for me, has led to so much better story yeah. writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's something to be said, said about that. So. What are your convictions when writing a story? Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I I have a whole paper about this. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, ooh. Crinkly paper in the microphone. Haha. <laughs> okay. That was very professional, me, that wasn't was very it? Very professional. Very professional. Uh so okay, so here's some of my writer's convictions. Um I just thought this would be a fun thing to share. Um because I remember it was during one of the missions week or something, I think. Like I I was sitting in um I guess it's a dance studio now, but it was like the the two hundred one. Yeah, two hundred one. Yeah. The choir uh choir s- room. room. Um, and there was like some. I, I honestly forget what it was about. Probably something with art. Um, <laughs> and I just started writing down all these writer, writers' convictions, and ex- it expanded over time. So, here's my personal writers' convictions. Um, and I just think this. Would, I thought this would be a fun thing to share with people. Uh, so here's the kind of things when I'm writing. I like to keep these things in my mind as I write. So, there's seven principles. Wait, nope. It looks like I expanded. Nine. Nine, <laughs> nine principles. Uh, the first one, I know how to count. The first one is the principle of play. Uh, simply, it's have fun, let work be play and experimentation. So, sometimes I will write um, and I will just think, okay, I need to get this done. This I can't be bothered to yeah. write anymore. Yeah, it's like this is not yep. fun anymore. Um, or you're just writing something because you know that that's what people want. And I know that's what a lot of people mm. do. Um, people pleasing. Yeah, um, right. or just like trend following. And that's fine. But that's not me. I'd rather have fun with what I'm doing. So, like, I'm, I only want to write a story, basically. A story that I will enjoy, that I am passionate about. So mm. a story that I can play with and experiment with um, and try different things with. So the principle of play is number one. Uh, the second one is the principle of work. So this goes hand in hand uh, with the first one. This one is don't be lazy. Spend time with your stories. Live it in your head, like I was saying earlier, uh, and see if it makes sense and then put it to paper. Uh, put pen to paper. So... With that, on one hand, uh, writing is like play. You get to play in your imaginary sandbox with all your imaginary acts and figures, and your well, your head's not imaginary. Um, right. And you get to just have them do fun and exciting and amazing things. Um, but on the other hand, it still is work. You still have to be consistent and set time for yourself, make time for yourself to actually write and pursue this dream of yours. Um, And you want to make sure you're writing in a way that's understandable. And sometimes Mm. that means doing your research, uh, learning about like different theories and writing, like the, um, oh, what's it called? The hero's journey and things like that. Yes, yeah. Yeah, or different, like I've, I've watched different things about like how in animation they break things up. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but I have a, a note had uh, written down with like okay here's like at this moment something big's gonna happen and interestingly enough it all kind of follows the uh, hero's journey a lot uh, yes most, most stories. stories I don't yep. want to say all um, but I think most do mm-hmm. uh, but there's some work involved in thinking through some of that so uh, should I move to the next one sure number three is the emotive principle characters require a motive yes you, the worst stories out there are passive leads. Yes, exactly. Um, I learned this one firsthand, uh, which goes with the uh, um, the next one, uh, the principle of change. This is, goes with the third one. Um, characters change the plot, mm-hmm. or the plot changes the characters. So the character doesn't necessarily need to change the plot in and of itself, but the character better change by that plot if that's the case. I've learned these two, um, including the next one I'm about to share, uh, with one of my drafts on the Night of Idosh. Um, like, the main character was kind of just moving along, 
I'm like, this isn't right. I'm going to fix this. And I did. I'm very proud of myself for doing so because now he's moving. Well, either the plot is moving him to the place he needs to be or he is literally taking up the sword and moving the plot. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah, that very important kind of a stuff. Or else you're going to just have a static story filled with image that's not going to be that exciting. Yeah, st- uh, some of the, some of the, uh, it can be done. Yeah. However, it's, it's, you've got to do it right. Um, I don't when, know if I know how to. Right. So. Stories that, <laughs> stories yeah. that are things that happen to people. Mm-hmm. Um, that's okay. But, but it's, it's really hard to make because, because, if you if you don't do anything if that if you just have a character that things happen to and they just respond to it and don't really push for anything that's not the most interesting yeah. at all. Mm-hmm. It, you ha- you should have a character that is wanting something that is motivated by something. Any great any any of the works that we that we as Western civilization calls great, mm-hmm. it always has a a person who. <laughs> needs to do something or is trying to do something mm-hmm. or uh or there are some things some where something happens to them and then they have to it's they're forced to do something yeah. and, and but they but they continue to do something exactly yeah mm-hmm. so it's you can't just have a story where things constantly happen and happen and and nothing happens to the yeah. character you bore everyone yeah and yourself <laughs> it's you that's like that. it's like a lot a lot of History is yeah. kind of like that. It's yeah. kind of boring. It's, it's history is history. A story is a story. Mm-hmm. Um, there are stories in history, uh, yes, but um, yeah, I'm not trying to write a history book. Right. <laughs> trying to write a story book. <laughs> so, yeah, so th- I would say the principle of change is important. Um, and then this that goes right into principle five. The protagonist should always be actively driving the story forward through his actions or lack thereof. Yes. I think lack thereof can also drive the story yes. too. Like, what if this character doesn't do this thing that he knows he should? Well, what might happen? Well, something is going to happen and it might not be what he or she wants to happen. Uh, and then there'll be consequences. So it's like a, one, one example I can think of is in Megamind where they refined Mega Man and he's like, I don't, I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. I'm just going to sit here, do, do nothing. Mm-hmm. And so Mega Mind is forced yep. to, yes. uh, to be the protagonist. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's exactly, that's exactly it. So, yeah. So get active is that one. Six is an interesting one. Uh, the parable principle. Mm. What is the lesson or truth that I am trying to communicate? Mm. What does it teach society? What does it commend or warn? Every story is teaching something. Every whether story, they know has, it or not. whether they know it or not, exactly. Every story has something they say. Watch your latest Disney flick, or uh, MCU film, or Star Wars. There is always some through line of some message that's trying to be conveyed, good or bad, um, that they are trying to put on us. And it's okay because as humans, we want to convey these things. We want to teach each other. Mm-hmm. It's not bad. Um, so my the way I approach writing a lot of times, especially the writing narratives, is um, almost like it's a parable. Uh, it's a story that has a lesson, oftentimes spiritual. Night of Ayadash has some pretty important spiritual lessons uh, that I found in my life um, in story format. Um, but it's also a story. It's not just, here is the sermon that I'm going to preach to you today. Please open the Bible right. too, which is there's a valid place for that um, in the church or even with friends sometimes. Well, lectures uh, are like that. It's, yeah, it's very much school. It's it's good to be taught scripture. Yeah. Um, like I love the churches that like will open up the Bible and look through the passage, like covering every single part of the verse. Mm. I love that stuff. <laughs> um, but that's preaching. Yeah, it's. Not always storytelling. Now, some preachers can do really good storytelling, and I love that. Um, some of my favorite preaching is that. Um, but you gotta, you gotta hit every point of the passage. Even if I'm not gonna be a pastor, I'm 100% going to be rooting for biblical preaching all the time, um, and good preaching. Right. So, but a, a sermon and a book is very different. Right. Uh, but it's interesting because when I look in the Bible, I see Jesus all the time talking in parables. Basically, talking in stories um, constantly. Um, like, sometimes people don't understand his stories. A lot of times they do. Uh, and when they don't, 
uh, he will explain to his disciples sometimes what they mean. Um, we as humans are wired to really enjoy stories, mm-hmm. uh, to consume them. Uh, that's why we watch so many movies, because we love consuming stories. Even music. It, same with music, and a lot, there's a lot of stories in music, even when you don't like realize it right off the top like of the, your head. Every song, every song has a message. Yeah, every song has a message or a story behind it. And I think it's the same with, uh, with uh, books. Every uh, book has a story behind it. Every story has a message or a meaning um, that um, has a point for the author. There's some, some, I don't remember what it's called, but there's, there's some sort of, uh, I've heard people say you can get any kind of a meaning out of a story. Um, yeah. In one sense, I get that, but in another sense, the author has an actual intention. Yeah, that's that's something that's uh, <sighs> oh my goodness, that's something that always gets me about the Bible is that like, well, this verse can mean anything. No, mm-hmm. there was one specific intent purpose for yeah. for writing that verse, and it's our job to figure it out. Maybe maybe God used that verse in a special way, in a unique way in your life, uh, but. And or even a movie sometimes not as powerful as scripture I'd say, um, not by a landslide, um, but uh, like even a movie or story or something like that. Um, where I feel I watch this movie and it means something to me. Mm-hmm. It, it like it really affected me powerfully and it makes me want to change or do something. Um, but like at least in scripture, um, and I think in films and uh, stories and books and comics or whatever it be. There is an actual authorial intent. Intent. Uh, you maybe you got something else from him out of it, but there's there is an you don't, actual intent. Don't, don't miss the context. Don't miss the, don't miss the context, yeah. and don't uh, don't think that your interpretation yeah, is, is the correct one. Is the correct yeah. one. It, and it, there's some people who speak with authority on scripture that may or may not be correct. We'll never know the true intent mm-hmm. of certain verses until we we get to heaven. We can uh, do our best. And we, we can do, do our, our best. best. We can, and we're trying to do our best. There's some people who who don't try their best, and yeah, <laughs> the, 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 it's unfortunate. But um, unless it's abstract art, there's always an intent. Yeah, and even abstract art, like the Sometimes intent is intent. to, to be, be abstract. abstract. Yeah. <laughs> so there's there's an intent even behind that. Um, so it's like, I I think everything has like every author has something that he's trying to say. Every storyteller has something that's trying to be said, and there is a definitive meaning uh, to it. Um, yeah, it might affect you in different ways, and I think mm-hmm. that's valid. Yes. But there's a definitive meaning. Meaning, um, And when Jesus told his parables, he wanted to um, get a spiritual point across that they were not going to hear any other way. Um, the Pharisees yeah. are like, well, is he talking about us? Yeah, wait, like, a, uh, the, you, wait a minute. We should go kill this guy. <laughs> I don't like yeah. him. Um, so like... He, he he used that um and like things like the whole uh um uh what is it it's the it's a classic example of a parable um the guy that got beat up on the road why am i not remembering the samaritan it? the samaritan good the good samaritan. samaritan the the jewish people then did not like the samaritans yes um and the samaritans did not like the jewish people either That's right. um they if jesus said yeah love your neighbor guys um, I don't really know. They wouldn't. They wouldn't have applied it to the good Samaritan. I mean, if they Jesus, he could have. He could have made them understood it. Um, but, but with the story, it really comes through. It's it's the reason why the gospels are written differently. Because uh, mm-hmm. uh, I forget exactly which one was written to, to who, but one was written specifically to the Jewish community. Yeah. One was written specifically Is with the Mark? spiritual. No, I Matthew. Think, Matthew, I think. Matthew. Because Matthew emphasizes, I think, the kingship of Jesus. Yeah, the kingship of Jesus through uh, yeah. be, by being Jewish. Um, mm-hmm. Mark was very specific. He was just writing to uh, tell a story. Yeah. Uh, Lou, uh, Lou, no, John was a physician, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, he... Wait, no, that was Luke. No, that, was, that Luke. was Luke. Luke was also a historian. So. Historian, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but, but John was, very, was explaining the spiritual side because he was... Yeah, he wanted them to understand what it meant that Jesus was the word of God, yes. the son of God. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> so, it, it, even... even the the Bible passages have a reason to like the book of Ruth mm-hmm. has doesn't I believe that's the only uh it's either Ruth or Esther that doesn't mention God whatsoever. Oh, uh, that's Esther. Esther, yeah, yeah, it's Esther. And the point of Esther is to show that God is working even though uh he's not overtly present. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really is. 
you don't see his name in it once, but you see his hand constantly, mm -hmm. even if the people in the situation can't. Yes. Um, so Jesus used parables to show uh, truths that people weren't necessarily going to give. And one of the things I want to do as a writer is to be able to connect with people through story to uh, share truths, especially those spiritual truths, maybe not in every story, but in uh, a big chunk of them, I want to be showing spiritual truths that people who might not really want to listen to these truths might be able to understand it in a new light and... Uh, mm -hmm. Um, at least for them, a new light. Uh, the, the truths don't change over time. Um, but our reactions to them can, and yeah. sometimes the way they're presented, can really affect. Yes. Um, uh, positively or negatively. Uh, at least the understanding that is the person's goal or responsibility. Or the person's response could be positive or negative, but to at least help them to understand that is. Uh, my goal. So, like right. this second book of Vaidash, that one's all about where does your strength come from. Um, and there's an answer. Read the book, you'll find out. Uh, it has something to do with God, I'll tell you that. Um, I'm really interested in your next uh, principle I'm seeing. Which one is it? The Clone Wars <laughs> principle. Okay, let's do that one next. So, the Clone Wars principle. Yeah. Um, be willing to go dark, but always be accessible to all ages. So, have you watched Star Wars The Clone Wars? Oh, of course Wars? I have, yeah. Yeah, I mean, who hasn't? I mean, I, oh, I know some people Star have, Wars but North guys, you should, if, you, if you haven't watched The Clone Wars, it's like the best show ever. I would die on that, die on that hill. Um, it's so great. Um, but Clone Wars, you've, you've seen The Clone Wars, you know, like, how dark it can get sometimes, like, with, like, the whole, like, inhibitor chips. So, like, with, if, you, yeah. if you haven't seen The Clone Wars, there's these guys Spoilers. called The Clones. Yeah. Um, and uh, spoiler for, like, a movie that came out in 2003, um, right. The clones turn on the Jedi, um, and I'm not going to tell you in case if you want to see the Clone Wars because I highly encourage that. Um, uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly what happens, but there's something called there's some chip in their heads that does something, um, and they explore and they exp exploit they ex explore they explore it. that uh, quite a bit, um, and that. That was dark, but it was accessible. Because right. I, I watched it as like a high school student, and I wasn't scared out of my mind. Um, yeah. Another show that does that really well, I was thinking about, was uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. Oh, yes, that's and, a good one. And that, mm. that I, I think even more better than The Clone Wars, because it deals with wow, tyranny. I'm agreeing to disagree on that, Well, it's Clone Wars. But... Mm. But it deals I'm with like war. Out. It deals with like loss of innocence mm -hmm. like immediately. And it, it, it deals with... Uh, it deals with political situations and masterfully. And I like, feel like we're describing the same show. It, well, it, it is. <laughs> it is almost the same show. Uh, it's uh, granted. I think Avatar was done better only because there are some seasons of Clone Wars where it's like a little. What's going on? That makes sense. Yeah, yeah there's seven seasons. I wish there would have been nine, but I'm happy we got a seventh. Right. I'm very happy if we got a seventh. But yeah, so Clone Wars goes dark sometimes. Um, but it's always accessible uh, to as many people as it can. Because let's be honest, the world's not a perfect place. No. Um, if we're thinking biblically, the curse of sin is like everywhere. And uh, because of that, things hurt. We hurt. Things happen that we can't control. We don't have control over everything in our lives. And I wish we did, <laughs> but we don't. Um, God does, uh, but we don't. Um, and things can sometimes seem pretty dark at times. Um, and Clone Wars shows us that, but even then, it's accessible. And Clone Wars did a pretty good job at yeah. even, like, I don't want to spoil the last season because it's a newer one, but even when everything seems to be falling apart, there's still Oops. a little bit of hope. Yeah. And I love that. I love that about it. And so, um, because I've ingested so much of the Clone Wars, I had to give it a principle right. on there. So. So the next one. The principle of audience. Uh, so craft for yourself, uh, craft your story for yourself. With a mind for the audience. So right mm. now I don't have a big audience just yet. Um, but this one's written so that in the future, if I do get a bigger audience, that I'm making sure, one, I'm writing the stories I want to write. But also, but also I want to make sure I know what my audience wants right. so that I can please them a little bit. Um, and maybe shock them a few times like, oh, here's something out of left field that I think you guys might like. I know I like it. Um, but... Yeah, I, I think having a mind for your audience will probably be important uh, in the future because you got to understand the people you're writing for. Yeah, and <sighs> even even now as you're, as you're starting, like I, I had to think about that uh, starting this podcast, like who's going to listen to this podcast, who's going to get uh, in information on this podcast. And originally it, it was just 
you know the local scene in Lancaster. But mm-hmm. I, I realized that this this stuff would probably be nice to listen to. I I know so many people who just like listening to people talk, and fine. and uh, <laughs> you know just like listen to people's stories. And so I was like, you know, what? I'm gonna broaden the list a little bit to uh, writers, poets, and because it's all it's all it's all it's all art anyway. It's all music mm-hmm. anyway, in one way or another. Um, so I, I figured that people are going to love to hear the writing aspect, the filming aspect, the, all the different aspects that are the, that is the music and art industry. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And so having a mind for the audience is pretty good too. Uh, the last one is diversify. The world is a diverse place. So craft characters that represents all colors, shapes, and ethnicities. Um, I just think that's important because I think people want to see themselves oh, um, sure. in a story like, I mean, one of the reasons I like Kung Fu Panda so much is because I can relate to this nerdy, big, like, uh, chubby little panda uh, who just has a lot of fun. It's like, I see myself somehow in Kung Fu Panda. Um, so it's like, if, if I see myself in that movie, shouldn't others uh, see, like, themselves. themselves in that movie? And the funny thing is even, like, Kung Fu Panda's a panda, like, I'm not a panda, but, like... But also, yeah. But also, it's, like, I, I relate to certain things. So I, I think it, it, it relates to, like, yeah, like, ethnicity and all of that, but different cultures as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of these different things, types. like uh, Encanto or uh, um, uh, Coco. Coco. Um, there was another one that came out recently that I forget what it is. What was there was another one that was really good. It was um, Kudo and the Two Strings. I haven't seen that one. Yet. Oh, you haven't seen that one? That's oh, so good. I want to. It's it so is. Good. Yes, it's oh, so good. good. Okay, it's on my list. It's on my list. But like, I don't necessarily. I'm not really a part of those cultures. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, the really good movies. Like, it helps me understand other cultures better. Um, and like, there's so many people that um like find so much value in that because they can mm-hmm. see themselves, and I think that's beautiful. So, yeah, I just want to uh, just always be getting better at doing that um, and making sure that, like, people can see themselves in the stories that are being told. So those are my nine writer's convictions. Um, yeah. All right, well. <laughs> there you go. There you with, have it. <laughs> with that said, we're kind of rounding out our time on the radio, so I would love to hear some of the poetry you have uh, set out for us. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I'm going to make sure that the radio people gets my favorite one. Okay. Uh, so this one is right at the beginning of the book. This is Poems for the Redeemed yes, Heart. Yes, Poems the way. for the Redeemed Heart by K.A. Bechtel. Hey, that's me. <laughs> so Hello, let's guy. open it up. Um, hmm. How how much time you've got before? Um, we'll do one poem and then and then we'll. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think if I should read the f- the foreword to this poem. It's uh, is it is it what is it? I'm gonna skip it because okay. it's three pages. Um, oh, we'll talk about it on Facebook Live. There you, you go. Us there. Yeah. Um. So very short. This um is just a look at Jesus uh through the eyes of different people in Scripture. Mm. Um, just a creative look at what different people might have been thinking about him during his ministry. Um, I think that's all you need to know. If you want me to read the foreword afterwards, unless if it's self-explanatory or itself. you could buy the book. Or you could buy the book and you'll see it yourself. There you go. Uh, but this is Jesus Through the Eyes Of. Jesus Through the Eyes of the Pharisees. Who does this man think he is to speak against our laws, to call us vipers, hypocrites, on whom God's wrath will fall? Does he not know who we are? We're teachers of God's law. He only says, listen to them, but be not like them at all. Maybe he has a demon. Maybe he's Satan's spawn. Yet still he keeps proclaiming that he will fulfill the law. He claims to come from God above and blasphemes God's pure name. He says we will not, he says, and says we will not see God if we don't believe his name. Jesus through the eyes of the poor. Whoever thought a man like this would talk to sinners so, he reaches out to the unclean and makes our bodies whole. The Pharisees say he's a fraud and say that he's possessed. But how can demons raise the dead and give the weary rest? I do not know who he may be, 
But this one thing I know, he welcomes the low and despised, so to him we will go. To see the captives' bonds released, as sick men's lives, as sick men's lives are healed, God's kingdom has been brought to earth. He wipes away our tears. Jesus, through the eyes of the disciples, we know he's much more than this. We know he's more than man. He, came, he claims to come from God above and forgives sinful man. He teaches us, but there's much more that we think he has planned. For we know he's the Christ of God who's come to save this land. Yet where is his army? Where is his sword? The Romans are still here. Mm. He says to love your neighbor and tells us, do not fear. But we just can't shake this feeling that he's got more in store. He speaks of crucifixion and says his death is sure. Jesus through the eyes of the Romans. Why did they bring this man to us? What danger could he be? They say to put him on the cross because of blasphemy. They say he's against Caesar. They say that he's a king. Though he's led no rebellion, what trouble could he bring? He claims to give life to a man. He claims to save the world. But now that he's upon the cr a cross, his failure is assured. People laugh as they walk by, as their king was lifted high. And so the innocent man died with a God forsaken cry. Hmm. Jesus through the eyes of the demons. We tried to tempt him in the flesh, but he would not give in. We knew that he would never sin, so we would just kill him. <laughs> the time to strike the heel has come, to destroy Adam's seed, who we laughed with hate, cursing God as we did the deed. Our prince knew that the end would come, our plans would soon unfurl, for still God ruled over all things and planned to save the world. But we don't care, we'll spread more lies, for that is what we do. Even though our plan may fail after a day or two, or three, Jesus through the eyes of the Father. But I sent him with purpose, to die a sinner's death, so that those who would trust in him might have eternal rest. He did what no other man could and fulfilled all my laws. He was the perfect sacrifice to reverse Adam's fall. I sent him to reveal myself and to show that God loved man and show that there's forgiveness in the Son of Man. My Christ came from the promised seed and in faithfulness he bore all the filthy sins of man, so they bear them no more. And I shall glorify my son and raise him from the dead and give him all authority for for the world he bled. And at his name all knees will bow and give eternal praise for through him and through him alone my people will be saved. Jesus through the eyes of the church. And now we do not stand condemned but can approach our God for he has given us righteousness, and in light now we trod. Nothing could ever separate us from his mercy great. We know we could not earn this gift. That's why we call it grace. And so we sing with outstretched hands and glorify his name, for he has given us new life. His people, whom he saved, we are the church, we are his bride, he is our friend and by our side. But best of all, he is our God. To Jesus be all praise. That's Jesus through the eyes of. That's pretty cool, man. Uh, that probably took a lot of research and um, like bi biblical research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was quite a bit of flipping through scriptures and uh, seeing what people said about him. Well, hey, this has been wonderful. Um, on the radio sides, we're gonna we're gonna end and go back to regular radio. If you want to listen more to the story podcast, we have. Uh, at least a little bit left to go through. Um, you can follow us at the uh, facebook.com forward slash this story podcast. No, sorry, 
Facebook.com forward slash the story Corey Rosen. That's C O R Y R O S E N. You can follow us on Spotify. Uh, search search the story Corey Rosen. You'll find us. It's the it's the red letters with the brick background, and it's really cool. If you want to find more stuff from Kenny, you can find him at Facebook. Uh, his page is Yanek. That is Y double N E K. Storybook, Storybunk. Sorry. Uh, Instagram K dot A dot Bechtel. You can find his books on Amazon, Mud and Daisies, and Poems for the Redeemed Heart. With that said, we're going to go... Thing, if you want to go to my blog, oh, I have yes. a preview right now currently of the book that I am currently writing. Oh. Yeah. And nice what's, the blog? what's the blog? Uh, it's kabechtel.com. It should pop up on the first thing right now. So. All right. Well, with that said, I hope you guys on the radio have a wonderful day, and it is time to get back to the radio. All right, Kenny. So with that done, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that that was really cool. That depicting the eyes or the, <laughs> depicting Jesus from the eyes of, yeah. of different of different people is uh, really was really cool to to listen to. Uh, have you ever thought about doing an audiobook? I haven't much. Um, because you put on a whole character and everything. Oh, that was yeah, that was fun. I thought of that yesterday when I was reading it, like rehearsing it uh, quickly. I was like. I can do it in voices. I'm gonna just do it, and so do it, yeah, no, do it. I don't know if I'm like uh, audiobook quality yet, but I mean, mm. I'm sure someone could make it audiobook quality. So, yeah, yeah. So as we're kind of we're kind of uh, almost because you said you had to go at two o'clock, right? I could. You could. I mean, I don't have to. Okay. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I I can go whenever whenever I want. Yeah. I it's, can work to like twelve o'clock p.m. if I have to, or a.m. if I have to. Please don't keep me that long. <laughs> no, I, I, I won't. I definitely not. But um, there are some questions that I'd love to ask uh, regarding um a few things, uh, and I forgot the question I was gonna lead into. But what? So I'm gonna just pop up one of these. Uh, so what is being a Christian? We like to worship God. What is worship to you? What is worship to me? You told me you were gonna an- ask me this, and I, I, I wasn't prepared. Okay, let's let's think through this. Hmm. Okay. Well, I think, uh, for for me, I know, um, worship has been through like writing and things like that. Um, honestly, I think whatever we do, um, if we do it with our mind towards uh Jesus, um, to honor Him, I think anything can be worship. Mm. Like. I think working can be worship. So when I work housekeeping and clean those toilets I don't like cleaning, um, I'm glorifying God, and that's worship. Um, when I'm at church singing, that's worship. Uh, when I'm listening to a sermon, uh, trying to uh, take in as much as I, as I can, even if I'm tired and I don't feel like listening, but I'm trying my hardest and uh, the Spirit is working in me, I think that's worship as well. Mm. Um, when I'm uh, writing, I think I already said that, but I think that's I think that's worship. Uh, pretty sure it is. Um, yeah, I I think worship is. I think anything can be worship when you do it to God's glory. Um, like I mean, think in the in the end of time when we are all in the new heavens and new earth, worshiping the Lord, um, like. You know, physical earth too. Like, I think everything we do will be worshipful. It doesn't mean like worship isn't like, oh, I have to sing a song right now, praise Yahweh. Um, we'll be doing it with full hearts. Yeah, full hearts. When when you do something with like your heart, like your heart committed to serving God, um, I think I think that's worship. I'm sure there is a better definition in Scripture for that. Um, yeah, you want to hear my definition? That I, I want to hear up right just now. Okay, let's hear it. Um, so, worship is the mindset of bringing praise to mm. or praising God. I like that. Yeah, I, th- I think I think that summarizes, for the most part, what worship is. Because um, uh, uh, being in the MWP department, the worship arts department, we talk about worship a lot because you know we do worship, uh, mm. worship songs, and uh, there's a, a lot a lot to be said about. Uh, Cause yeah, you're a worship artist, but what does that really mean? Mm-hmm. You know, I can just sing songs about God, and that's worship. But there's so much more than that. There's it's it's so much a broader term that can be used. Cause I I can be 
I can be acting on stage and then still be worshiping God mm -hmm. because you're bringing you. What if you're you're acting in uh maybe Godspell or Amazing Grace and you're mm -hmm. showing uh God through uh your your job or I'm just talking to somebody. I'm I'm showing the love of Christ to them. That's worshiping God. You're showing mm -hmm. the love of Christ through, or you're show you're showing Christ through just conversations. That's bringing glory to God, mm -hmm. and um, that's being a light in the world. To be that's worshiping God. It's it's so there's so many things you can do that uh, without um unintentionally or without intentionally thinking that oh i'm gonna worship god now yeah it's just stuff that happens that oh right now you are worshiping god even though you're mm. not thinking about it you're worshiping god i've even watched movies and i feel like i was worshiping god mm. um, because i'll watch a movie and then i'll realize somehow like this uh like um the, the like the directors or the writers or something hits some sort of core truth they might not even be Chris, Christians, um, but like they hit this core truth that just is like, oh, that's biblical. Mm -hmm. That's pretty accurate. And then I'll see that and I'll be like, oh, sometimes I'll just pause the movie or I'll just in the middle of it. I'm like, wow, God, that is that is true. Let me worship you because of that. So I, I think anything can be used as worship. Um, it's all about the heart. I it's think. all about the heart. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we had kind of talked about pre-show about like balancing life, work, and writing. How does uh, and I I know from just knowing you that you have a strict regiment almost uh to almost. commit writing, but totally. Yes. Um. What is Kenny's regiment of writing? Uh, I've gotten to the point where I basically have a strict regiment of writing. Um. So balancing work, balancing life, balancing writing. Um, balance is important in life. Absolutely. Um, and I don't always do the best at it, but I try um, my best. Um, so I find that I always want to be able to write a little bit um, every single day. Um, it's just practice at that yeah, point. It's yeah, really, it's really good practice. Um, and you actually get stuff done when you're consistent. Did you know that? Yeah, did you know that? Yeah. Oh my God. And you actually get better at it, too. You do, it's, too. it's so wild. I know. Like, I, I practiced piano for a week, and oh my gosh, I can do scales. I, I wow. still can't do scales, but good for you. I know, right? It was the same, same similar concept. Yes. Like, you're never going to get good at something unless you practice and exactly. you're going at it. Yeah. And uh, that's... And talk talk about self torture. Practice is self torture in in, in, in of itself because mm -hmm. um, you you say you a block out an hour right or two uh two two uh, hours for the most part I've um because I've realized that like uh, like I was saying with the calling thing earlier um how calling became like almost like okay this is my purpose in life and it's like no it's not <laughs> um I've it's it has been two hours, but now I take fifteen minutes about when I'm eating my lunch instead of writing while I have a sandwich in my mouth, which is difficult. I've tried it. Yeah. Um, I I read like a, a book, uh, a spiritual like sort of like spiritually oriented book, uh, to just make sure that my mind's in the right place. Um, and that's been very wholesome and beneficial. Uh, but for the most part. If we cut out that 15 minutes of doing that, uh, yeah, it's two hours uh, every weekday, basically. Um, and my boss, Esther, has been amazing to let me take a two-hour break um, like pretty much every single day. Um, the only thing that, for me, I know is if I take that two-hour break, I need to make the sacrifice of being here at LBC as my, as my full-time job longer the day. Yeah. So I could be leaving at 4.30, but instead, I'm leaving at 6, six yep. because I'm going to be taking a two-hour break to make sure that I'm pursuing what I think my dream is, what I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a balance to that. Like, I can't just not work. Um, when, I wrote the, uh, <laughs> when I wrote Mud and Daisies, that was a creative writing assignment. Um, uh, they wanted me to write like a short story about this family and all that. And I had this weird story about this mud like covered lady and these kids trying to like uh getting lost in the forest and her helping them or something like that in my head. Um and I was like, I kinda just wanna write that. Mm -hmm. So uh um I shouldn't have done this. But uh instead of going into work one time, I ended up going to work late <laughs> because I wrote like 
don't know how many pages it was. It wasn't 40 pages then, but it is now. But it was at least like 20 pages of um, this story. I basically wrote the entire thing through um, and submitted it. And I, it, was only, it only needed to be like a thousand words or something like that. And 10 pages is way more than a thousand. Yeah. So, yeah, um, that's not good. You don't want to do that. No. You want to make sure you make uh, time for where you're working. Um, I have a dedicated space to yeah. it. Yeah, so well. because I have a two-hour uh, spot, and right now this works, I don't know how this is going to work in the future. If uh, anything changes, I'll have to figure that out as I go. Right. Um, but right now I have a two-hour spot where I can give my heart and soul to cleaning all those dorms um, or buildings, um, which is chaos sometimes. Yes. Um, and then I have, <laughs> I like to say, a peaceful moment of writing. But depending on where I'm at in the story, um, it's not always peaceful. Uh, it can be chaotic, and I don't know what I'm doing sometimes. Um, but I have that time to write. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have, um, I just finish work after that. Um, and then, yeah, so balancing work and balancing writing is good. Ideally, one day I'll get to the point where writing will be just my work. But I'm right. not there yet. Yeah, it's been something I've been trying to work on as well because I, as a music composer, you need to compose music to get better at composing mm -hmm. music. And, and it's it's something that surprises me every single time or blows my mind every single time. It's like, oh, yeah, I actually have to do my craft in order to get better at it. Um, so what I've been trying to do is trying, trying, keyword, to keep a schedule that I can do do music in some aspect or another so whether it is just you know i spend an hour listening to new music on spotify mm -hmm. or and actually this podcast has helped immensely with getting new music to listen to on spotify and stuff that's like uh pretty good that's that i didn't i had much expectation for mm -hmm. uh and that's some that's a block that i need to get rid of for sure because just because it's not good and not uh popular it doesn't mean yes. it's not good yeah um uh and uh the, but i really do want to have an hour dedicate an hour or like write a song every single day mm -hmm. or like uh dedicate an hour to uh listening to a podcast every single day about music or listening like stuff that, that further furthers my craft um that i can like sit sit down and i i already know i i, I listen to many hours of of news on yeah. my, one of my favorite news podcasters and I was like, what if I just switch that with, like, music? Imagine how much mm. better I could get. Um, I'd be less informed about the world, so I had to figure that out. But um, It's chaotic. It's cha Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a balance for sure. Mm. But, um, yeah, just even if you're, like, what, have do music or, or something as a hobby, dedicate a little bit of time to it. See where it takes you. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of what I did the same thing with uh, writing. So I have that two-hour slot. Um, and then when I get home... My, it's not a rule, but I try not to focus too much on writing, except maybe some ideas I have in my head. Mm. Um, because I need I need time to rest. Um, God gave us a day of rest for a reason, because we need to make sure we're resting. Um, and I mean, rest is all about relying on God too. Uh, yes. that whole theology thing there. Um, so yeah, I I get home and then I rest, and that's usually watching a movie or a show. Or playing a video game, um, but I also like to have a lot of fun with friends as well. Like be watching movies. Um, it's usually just watching movies, um, but every so often I'll do some other stuff as well. Uh, like be it like game nights or whatever. Um, so, and that's that's important too because I don't want to be the writer because there's there's this um, there's this image of the writer uh, that you see in pop culture all the time, and I think sometimes it's accurate where. I'm a writer. I am sitting in front of my desk all day, and I will talk to nobody. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm writing about people, uh, I right. will write about these people in my mind and no other people ever, Like, because I don't want to talk to people because I'm consumed by my work. I don't want to be that writer. Right. Um, I want to be I want to be a person before I'm a writer. Um, and that means <laughs> <laughs> writers aren't people. <laughs> writers aren't people. We are robots. Um, but yeah, I want I want to um make sure that I'm making time for my friends, for my family, uh, for all of that important stuff. Uh, um, because I mean that's really what life is made of. Mm -hmm. Um, like when I write, I'm just kind of making a mirror of life. Uh. It's not life in and of itself, um, but it reflects life. And 
if you can't reflect life if you're not living your own. So yeah, yeah, that's that's so the whole balance between work um, and uh, writing and friends, I th- and like just like personal time to just rest and take care of yourself because that's very important. Mm. Um, it's so important to have that balance. Um, and that's kind of how I've been finding that balance. Granted, sometimes I will go home like, well, I didn't write this day, so I'm going to write a little bit. I don't do it perfectly. Um, and sometimes it's good to do that. Other times I need some rest. So it can look different depending on where you're at in life. Um, but I think finding balance between those three is pretty important. Yeah. So uh, kind of wrapping up, what is one thing that you know now that you had wish you had known when you first started? Like writing mm. wise. Hmm. Good question. Something that I know now and that I didn't know when I was first. Writing. Like any advice that you have been given? Any uh, specific? Uh, like like don't worry about it or. Okay. Let's see. Um. Hmm. I mean, my main advice that I've given myself was like, just do it. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean that's truly. Tr- yeah, honestly, that is the advice that r- made me do this podcast. Was yeah. just literally just do it. Stop. Don't worry about it because I can get caught up in yeah. being a visionary oh, yeah. way too much, mm-hmm. and and it's just like, well, I have to have this perfect, this perfect, this perfect, this perfect. But no, just do it. Yep. Yeah. Get it done. Yeah. So like that, I think it's something that I've been trying to live by, at least with writing, um, just doing it. Um, so. But as for something like, hmm, I will say the fact that I've already written like the book of poems, um, which was kind of a collection, um, the short story, and then the two that I'm currently working on now, I didn't see myself getting this this far when I first started. Mm. So I think I would say to younger Kenny, as of like three years ago, um, like this, you could actually do this. Don't be discouraged. Um, and, uh, ah, here it is. Here it is. It's not going to be perfect. The first draft, because it takes a lot more than one draft. Like sometimes it takes like five or six. It's the first draft for a reason. Yeah. It, it's the first draft is a lot of times ugly. Um, but you have the building bo- blocks usually mm-hmm. to make something great. So I would tell myself that, uh, um, don't aim for perfection right away. I don't even know if you should ever aim for perfection, but aim for your best. Mm. So I th- I think that's important. So yeah, I would I would say first draft sucks. Um, so just do your best um, with that, and uh, don't expect it to be perfect right away. You're gonna have to work on it. So that's what I've learned. Um, that I would tell younger than Kenny. Mm. If wow. that makes sense. This has been a lovely day. A mm-hmm. lovely time. Yeah, dude, this this has been a lot of fun. Yeah. So if you want to find Kenny, you can find him at k is it k.a.bechtel.com? Uh, I don't think you can put periods other I don't than think the you can com, either. So yeah, it's just so it's k-a-bechtel.com. K-A-Bechtel.com. Try to rebrand that site. Yeah, so go ahead and check him out there. Check out his books on Amazon um, and look out for future uh, f- his future books that are coming out uh, soonish. Um. Yeah, soon as soonish. I don't know when soonish is, uh, but you can be sure that <laughs> I'm actively the working on them. Um, and I have book one and two of the thing I'm working on, Night of Iodash, basically written. I'm just doing edits right now. So. All right. Well, with that said, this has been the Story Podcast with Corey Rosen. You can find us at facebook.com forward slash the story Corey Rosen or on Spotify and all streaming platforms. Just search the story Corey Rosen. It'll pop up. And with all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful day and see ya. See ya.